The Data Collectors Written by Danielle Pai Narrated by Graham Mack and Danielle Pai 7. Sabrina and Hamish Friday evening, five years after the assembly Sabrina was used to getting her way, always, and Hamish secretly worried about the consequences the first time that did not happen. When she was sweet, which wasn't very often, she was very sweet, but when she was angry, venom poured out of her eyes, literally. Still, after fifty-eight years of marriage, he felt an odd sense of duty to her, It wasn't love, exactly, was it? No, maybe not. He wasn't sure. Sabrina felt out of place in her surroundings, and he knew she hated that. She often wore ill-fitting pantsuits or black dresses and red lipstick, along with equally red nails in an attempt to pass as more human-like. However, her flat nose and grey-toned skin were difficult to cover up with makeup. She contemplated cosmetic surgery and pigment injections for the trip, but decided against it, since she found herself to be exceptionally gorgeous under normal circumstances. None dared to disagree with her. Ham? His wife's voice jolted him to attention, rattling his nerves. Yes, my love? We're going to need to have another baby. If you say so, my love. Right away. She pulled him into the bedroom suite. Twice has evolved, and it's a shame we still have to do things the primitive way. Hamish and Sabrina were among the last of the royals. Somehow, they evolved slightly faster than almost any species in the universe. While aging approximately 68% more slowly than Earthlings, and 18% more slowly than the rest of the known multiverse. It was no myth that they could regrow organs and limbs if not mortally wounded or suffering an incurable disease. There weren't many. And they could adopt their lizard features to protect their outer form when under attack. This included rugged leathery skin and venom that flowed from their nails at will if they scratched you. They weren't always particularly fond of this form, mind you. But it was functional during wartime and, unfortunately, involuntary when under duress. Sabrina pulled Hamish close to her in a tight embrace. Hamish gave her an obligatory peck on the lips. Hamish was much shorter and wider than his wife, looking more like a plump iguana stuffed into a three-piece suit. Why did you kiss me? she demanded. I didn't tell you to do that. I was being affectionate, Hamish explained. I thought you'd like it. My dear stupid husband, this isn't about affection. It's about survival. Haven't you noticed that of all the species across the universe, humans are the only ones who have devolved? And yet their populations are three times that of our royals in spite of our evolution. So are fruit flies, but what's the value in them? I can't wait until we can clean the slate and try again. We've tried before. What makes you think it will work this time? Because this time we have a genetically born data collector to help us. And why would she be inclined to do that? You saw what happened to Cepheus, she reasoned. Hamish nodded solemnly. Then you know how persuasive I can be. Not forty-five minutes later, the royals were ready for the evening's dinner in the hotel's banquet hall. Sabrina surrounded herself with fellow royals, along with neighbouring species that she deemed acceptable. Running the only five-star casino hotel she knew of in the area that was both maintained by and catered to royals. The general population was unaware, as it was managed by humans who were paid exceptionally well to keep their mouths closed. It only took one leaker to the local paper to mysteriously die by accidentally getting run through a commercial dishwasher several times before, even more unwittingly, becoming locked in the walk-in freezer overnight for the rest of the staff to catch on. Yes, employees were carefully vetted and often included underground aliens doing their best to blend in with the human population in the event they needed to act as the public face of the casino 
to answer any odd rumours that might be floating around. Rumours, for instance, that thanks to elusive architecture, the hotel was sectioned off so that earth guests stayed on one side and aliens on the other. The two sides never to meet. The outside world must never know that the aliens who frequented the place were as illegal as the money they gambled. The currency at the Royal Casino was the Earth Dollar. While Sabrina detested humans, she still loved their money. It was considered of special value in the universal marketplace, because once humans went extinct, their money would cease production and become valuable antiques. She already had plans to create a money-lined room in her palace when she returned home. Sabrina and Hamish waltzed through an alien banquet hall, followed by Fredo, their personal bodyguard. Fredo was a formidable beast, with a bright red salamander-shaped body and arms and legs as large as tree trunks. He wore what could only be described as a form-fitting black wetsuit that kept his skin moist and his body cool. Guests looked up from their one-armed bandits, roulette wheels and card tables as they passed, most choosing to wear cocktail dresses and suits from the world they were visiting, though many were noticeably from the wrong time period. A chestnut-haired woman, donning what could be best described as a black-and-white gothic cocktail uniform, carried a large box filled with candies and cigarettes. She presented it to Hamish as he passed, who politely declined. Fredo intercepted, not so politely, telling her to kneel before her sovereign. That won't be necessary, Hamish began, but it was too late. She'd already kneeled dramatically balancing the box of goodies on her thigh, uncomfortably. You don't approach the sovereigns, and you don't speak unless spoken to, Fredo spat, swiping his arm and tossing the remnants of her box all over the floor. Sabrina smirked at first, until she noticed a few disapproving glances from her guests. Forgive me, my dear. She leaned over the woman, taking her by the chin, and lifting her upward until the maiden had no choice but to stand. My serf is quite protective of his ambassadors. I would love a box of your delightful cigarettes. The girl, along with several staff members who heard the commotion, rushed to her side, helping to gather up the contents of her box, before she sheepishly presented it to the queen. Sabrina selected one. Matches? The girl inquired and winced in Fredo's direction. Not necessary, thank you, Sabrina announced, swiping a nail across the tip of the cigarette. A small ember quickly began. She puffed for a moment. Most acceptable. They continued down the aisle as a quiet sign that guests should collect their things and follow the procession. Dinner would begin shortly. 8. Lucine meets Cepheus. Friday at midnight, or thereabouts. Five years after the assembly. Something that went bump in the night startled Lucine from an incredibly unproductive nightmare about being kidnapped by aliens for special powers she did not possess. She sat up quickly as her eyes struggled to adjust to the blackness, vaguely aware that the night light was offering no assistance. She threw the blankets off and planted her feet on the carpet. She tugged at her pinstriped pyjama top, adjusting her matching pants as she stood. The gear, uh, what you doing, kitty? Lucine called out to the black house cat. The room went silent as she fumbled for the light switch. As the bulb flickered to life, she let out a scream. A cloaked figure the size of a full-grown man crouched atop her dresser. His face was partially shielded by the black cape, and he peered over his shoulder with lizard-yellow eyes and an ibis-beaked nose. His skin was pale yellow with a green hue. Brrr. A sound murmured from under his cape. Lucine's heart was pounding loudly in her ears as she put a downturned palm out in front of her. Please do not hurt my cat, 
she implored the beast. The beaked figure glanced down at his cloak. As it fell away from his arm, Bagheera could be seen cradled in the beast's arms as the figure pat him gently with his opposite hand. I want the cat, Cepheus answered simply. The beast leapt gracefully to the floor and headed toward the bedroom door. Bagheera still nestled in one arm. No. Lucine spoke firmly, picking up the nearest weapon she could find, a weighted brass hand mirror. The beast looked at his reflection in the mirror, as if mesmerized by his own image. But I want the cat, he paused. I want that reflective glass, too. He moved towards her. Stop, Lucine commanded. The beast obeyed, shrinking backward like a chastised animal. I don't know who you are. Cepheus. I'm sorry, what? Lucine asked. I am called Cepheus, and I want the... Yes, I understand. Uh, Cepheus, you want the cat, but you may not have the cat. He crinkled his face in discontent. However... She held out the brass mirror. You may have this mirror. Bagheera wiggled out of his captor's arm and leapt to the ground, just as Cepheus snatched the mirror from Lucine's grasp. But instead of running to safety, as was his typical behaviour around strangers, Bagheera stood by the man's dirty leather boots, grooming. Cepheus gazed at his reflection and murmured, I would never hurt the cat. The intruder blocked the entrance to Lucine's bedroom and she had little confidence in her ability to pry the window open in a timely enough manner to leap to her escape. Cepheus? Her voice crackled nervously. Who are you, and why are you in my house? The beaked man's eyes rolled slightly, and he swayed his head back and forth as if he were trying to sift through files in his brain and remember something. In her own way, Lucine was doing the same. Why was that name so familiar? She tapped the side of her head with her palm, as if to knock things in her brain back into place. A sudden knock at the door made Lucine jump. Under normal circumstances, she would have screamed for help at the top of her voice. But as she looked down, she noticed Bagheera was paring as he rubbed up against the man's boot. Instead, she asked, May I answer the door, please? Cepheus seemed confused. The door did not ask you a question. The knock repeated more insistent. Lucine! A voice called from outside. Tanager, I'll be right there. To Cepheus, she asked. Would you please let me through to open the door? Let you through what? He asked, leaning over to show Bagheera his reflection in the mirror, smiling broadly, revealing a row of saw-like teeth. Cepheus, she tried again calmly. Please walk forward three steps. He took exactly three steps forward, and Bagheera followed him. The mirror caught light from the lamp and reflected a bright beam on the carpet. The cat began chasing the light, pouring at it in vain. Cepheus let out a gleeful snort, bearing sharp teeth once again. Lucine took the opportunity to rush through the bedroom door. A soft light from a lamp in the living room left on when Fatima was working late partially filled the room, giving more light bouncing opportunities for her cat. Bagheera, she called as she ran to the kitchen door in an ineffective attempt to get her cat to follow her. She didn't expect that he would, as he never had in the past. She stood in front of the red door reaching her hand out, but unable to open it. Tanager could feel her energy on the other side of the door. Lucine, please let me in. I can't. The door's locked and I have to get out, she answered helplessly. She ran to the window and quickly unlatched it. She had one leg on the side table and the other over the sill when Tanager came around the corner and stopped her. I can help, he reassured. Let me out, there's a strange being. Cepheus, I know, he answered. Let me in. Lucine pulled her leg back, glancing nervously over her shoulder toward the bedroom. Cepheus was still playing with Bagheera, 
waving the mirror around as the cat bounced on stray light beams. Tanager gently nudged his way past her as he climbed through the window, tipping his hat in an apologetic gesture for his brashness. He glanced momentarily at her very thin pyjama set, which did little to hide the details of her form. He tried not to notice. Lucine leapt from the table and followed him. Cepheus, he commanded, please stop whatever it is you are doing and come out here, please. Lucine pulled her shoulders back, trying to make sense of what was happening. Cepheus appeared round the bedroom door, grinning sheepishly like a small child. He walked out of the bedroom, clenching the new beloved mirror to his chest, with Bagheera right at his heels. He smiled down at the black feline. I want the cat, he explained to Tanager. Yes, I know you do, my friend, Tanager answered calmly as he removed his fedora and placed it on the dining room table. He began peeling his leather-brown gloves off. But please be careful. If her cat were injured in some way, Lucine would be very upset. Cepheus recoiled as Tanager came closer. I would never hurt the cat. Cepheus dropped his gaze in shame. Or oh, Lucine. Lucine was startled at the sound of her name as it passed his lips. There was something familiar about his voice. Where had she heard it before? I know you would never intentionally hurt anyone, Tanager set the gloves on the table beside the fedora, walked around the dining area until he was within arm's reach of Cepheus. Now, as I was saying, before Cepheus could react, he placed a small cylindrical tube inside one of his ears and released a puff of air from a vacuum seal. Cepheus's eyes rolled backward and his lean body lurched forward. Tanager put out an arm to catch him, struggling slightly with Cepheus's tall frame. Lucine jumped at his side, helping as Tanager guided Cepheus over to the couch where the faint beast promptly collapsed in a heap. Tanager did his best to adjust the beast's limbs so that his arms and legs weren't sprawled in every direction. He'll come round in a few minutes, you'll see. Well, that's reassuring. Lucine threw her hands in the air. What the hell's going on? And who are you people, really? Are you sure you don't know already? Tanager stood up, looking intently into her eyes. His gaze made her uncomfortable, but there was something soothing about it. She still felt anxious about tonight's activities, but no longer threatened by either of the men. What kind of weird hypnosis is this? Know what? You're not making any sense. As if on autopilot, Lucine made her way into the kitchen and pulled a bag of pork rinds from the pantry. Among her many eccentricities, Lucine was also a nervous eater. She began munching on a rind as Tanager looked at the bag distastefully. Life was completely normal until you showed up yesterday, and now him! She pointed at the slumped-over Cepheus before licking her fingertips. Bagheera now sat at his feet, watching expectantly. Normal? he questioned. I am curious as to your definition of normal. What's that supposed to mean? Lucine demanded. For example, is it normal that you have the worst diet of anyone I have ever seen, and yet you have the body mass of an athlete? My diet is just fine. Besides, I exercise. And how would you even know what my diet is like? Or my body mass, for that matter. I don't even know what my body mass is. No. Fatima exercises daily, and she's still a good 20 pounds heavier than you. She eats better, too. Again, how would you know that? Have you been stalking us? Is that what you were doing outside the grocery store the other day? Now, thirsty from munching on the pork rinds, she reached in the refrigerator for a can of ginger beer, annoyed at what she perceived as a distinct invasion of privacy. Well, no, Tanager explained calmly. Stalking implies that I am obsessed with you and am a threat. Aren't you? 
Lucine squinted her eyes at him, not really believing it herself. No, it might be better if you sat down, Talager suggested. Pulling a chair out from under the dining room table, Lucine sat, taking the pork rinds and ginger beer with her. Tanager took a seat across the table. We've been watching you for several weeks now, trying to find the right time and the best way to make our introductions. We? Meaning you and the lurking vampire over there? Lucine gestured towards Cepheus before snatching a napkin from the dispenser on the table, resulting in several sticking together with orange pork rind smudges. She fought to no avail with the napkin holder. I really wanted to reveal this in a more delicate way, he paused with minor annoyance as he helped steady the dispenser for her. But we appear to be short on time. You're going to tell me that you and Cepheus aren't from this planet. Yeah, that much I figured out. Tanaji was surprised. Lucine let out a snort and took a sip of her soda. And you came all this way to give me nutritional guidance? Lucine's snarky side was always unleashed when she felt defensive or misunderstood in some way. Yes, and we knew your parents. Do you remember? Lucine's breath caught in her chest. What do you know about my parents? A moan from the couch interrupted their conversation. Cepheus sat upright, rubbing his head. How long have I been in the other state? he asked Tanager. Oh, about thirty minutes or so. I came looking for you as soon as you disappeared. Oi! Lucine jumped at the sound of a resonant voice coming from the window. Everything okay in there? Ivan popped his head through the open window. Yes, my friend, Cepheus answered, struggling to his feet. I apologize for my episode. I'm okay now. Wait, you know these two? Lucine looked at Ivan. Ah, uh, well, yes and no, Ivan struggled for the right words and then decided that answer was sufficient. Ivan agreed to help us solve a problem with our vessel. He is quite brilliant, Tanager offered. Right. Lucine squinted her eyes again. Something in her brain connected with something in Tanager's brain. Because you need to leave Earth and return to Erd. She took a sip of her drink, absent-mindedly. Tanager paused. What makes you think we are from Erde? What? She looked up as if distracted. I have no idea where you're from. Lucine answered, with no recollection as to what she had just blurted out. What I want to know is what you know about my parents. Tanager gave her a sideways, confused puppy stare before exchanging questioning glances with Cepheus. What? Why the looks? Lucine demanded. I'm begging your pardon. Ivan called from the window. But can someone open the door so I can join in? Unless this is a private conversation. It's not, Lucine answered. But these gentlemen were just leaving. Tana just started to protest. You cannot be here when Fatima gets home from work, she told him. And furthermore, you cannot tell her anything about this. Aye, Ivan agreed. Don't know what all happened here, but her heart is weak. And she should nay be stressed. Why don't ye two come back to my place and leave the ladies be? With that, Ivan vanished from the window. Okay, Tanager reluctantly agreed. But we need to continue this conversation. Very soon. Cepheus leaned over to give Bagheera a final scratch behind the ear. To Lucine he said, My memory is foggy, but... I hope I didn't do anything inappropriate. Lucine could feel the sorrow in his heart. He continued to stare at her, as if she were a long-lost daughter that he hadn't seen in a very long time. He wanted to hug her and tell her everything, but he knew the timing wasn't right. Instead, he smiled at her with a sense of pride in spite of everything. Here she was, alive and well. She was resilient just like her parents. Not at all, she replied gently, shaking him from his reverie. If it makes you feel any better, my memory's a little foggy too. I don't understand how that would make me feel better, 
he answered in earnest, fumbling between clarity and confusion. Lucine was too tired to explain the expression. Tanager unlocked the door, and Cepheus made his exit. Ivan on the other side, carefully taking his arm to assist. To Lucine, Tanager asked, Are you okay to... Lock up? She answered, somewhat embarrassed. Uh, would it be a terrible bother to ask you to bolt the front door from the inside and... She motioned toward the window. Of course not. I mean, no bother at all. He tried to focus on her face, not the rest of her. She felt a strange buzzing across her skin as he passed in close proximity to her. She noticed it briefly in the car ride the day prior, but now it seemed to be getting stronger. It was only after he'd climbed through the window and she'd secured the latch that she realised he'd left his hat and gloves behind. The sound of an unhappy car motor could be heard coming from down the street. Fatima. Lucine quickly snatched the gloves, stuffing them into the hat and tucking them under her arm. She then grabbed the rinds and soda before retreating into her bedroom and shutting the door. After depositing everything, she held on to her dresser. She quickly shut off the light and felt her way to her bed. It was only after she was snuggled beneath the covers that she realised she'd forgotten something. From behind the door, she could hear Fatima fumbling with the lock. Once inside, she heard her friend say, Oh, Bagheera, did your mom forget to take you into her room before bed? Damn it, Lucine thought. That's okay, kitty, Fatima cooed. You can come sleep in my room tonight. Nine. The International Registry of Alien Residency. Five years ago. Several weeks before the assembly. Lucy Jones, come in! Drake Cushing invited Lucine into his office. Shut the door behind you if you don't mind. He looked her over from head to toe, admiring the shape of her legs and the way her flared knee-length skirt moved when she walked. Her white blouse, however, was buttoned up to the neck. Disappointing. Lucine blushed at the attention, not considering the possibility that his gaze was borderline inappropriate. In fact, in her mind, this was the beginning of a recurring fantasy she had in her head about her boss. Don't just stand there like a lemming, sit down, he directed her toward a chair across from the desk where he sat. And the fantasy was gone. She sat crossing her legs modestly at the ankles and resting a notepad in her lap, tapping her pen nervously against it. He smiled his usual toothy grin. Standing up, he moved over to the front of the desk, sitting on the edge of it with his legs extended and hands supporting his weight by grasping the top of the desk on each side of his hips. His new authoritative position was unnervingly close to Lucine, who was forced to look up at him to meet his gaze. After what seemed like an uncomfortably long silence, he spoke. I have a new assignment for you, he announced, suddenly. Oh. Lucine was surprised. The past three years had been tedious, to say the least. She was beginning to think she'd be stuck in the file room forever if she didn't do something about it. I don't think we've been utilising you to your full potential. I admit, part of that was my fault. I always thought you received special treatment because of your situation. He glanced at her arms. She crossed them nervously, covering up the burnt-in scars. By... Special treatment, Drake was referring to the fact that she went to college with a partial, need-based scholarship. When added on to a modest academic scholarship, she had enough to get through her undergraduate degree, but just barely. As an orphan, being shuffled from one house to another, she took it upon herself to move out on her own by special government permission, as soon as she'd turned seventeen. The following year she'd applied to a state university and qualified for assistance. But I went back and looked at your file. Why? Lucine was legitimately curious. No particular reason. He cleared his throat and stood up, doing a three-quarter turn before changing his mind about something and sitting back down. Well, that's not exactly true. 
I happen to notice uh, other newer employees moving out of that file room, but not you. I confess, I thought it was a competence issue. But then, he moved to his desk drawer, pulling out a file that had about four pages in it at best. I looked at your resume, top of your class. You then worked your way through grad school, and in the past three years you haven't taken a single sick day and have received nothing but stellar performance reviews, which makes me wonder, why on earth did you never ask for a promotion or to be moved to a department with opportunity for growth? Lucine gave the question some serious consideration. I don't know, she answered quietly. It was the truth. Well, I noticed. He dropped the file on his desk with a sense of smug satisfaction. And if you're willing, of course, I'd like to give you a test assignment. Lucine nodded with a sense of excitement and apprehension. She was flattered to have received the attention of her department's director. But the thought of leaving the file room suddenly felt rather terrifying. Of course, she practically whispered. Good, he answered. I should warn you that I'm dealing with some sensitive information. I trust you will keep it to yourself. Lucine nodded. Who would she tell? Was that a yes? He paused impatiently. She nodded again before adding, Yes. Good, that's what I thought. He went back to his desk. First, I need you to retrieve some files for me. The file numbers are... Lucine opened her notepad, ready to take down the numbers. No, don't write them down. Just remember them. He has a lot of unwarranted faith in my memory, she thought. I-R-A-R-4. Wait, I don't have the clearance to access files from the International Registry. Lucine interrupted. I know. He leaned uncomfortably close, looking into the distance as if making a decision before turning his gaze back toward her. Neither do I. Lucine returned a questioning expression. There are forces at work here that require us to break the rules for the greater good. I need someone I can trust. I trust you, Lucy. He smiled broadly. He could tell from her facial expression that that trust was not shared. He walked back to his desk and took a seat opposite her, planting his forearms on his desk and leaning in as if letting her in on a special secret. I have a story to tell you, he spoke quietly forcing her to sit on the edge of her seat and lean in to hear him. When I was a young boy, I almost drowned during a storm. Really? Lucine was intrigued. It's true. My younger brother, Bryce, you may remember him from the office holiday party last year. Lucine remembered Bryce was the complete opposite of his older brother. Where Drake oozed confidence and always showed up for every special occasion dressing in a tailored suit with an attractive, well-proportioned fashion model on his arm, Bryce preferred to live in his brother's shadow. He wore understated brown dress slacks and an ivory shirt to every company event. If there were more than a dozen people in the room, he became nervous and would hug the least occupied corner. With a watered-down drink in his hand, his equally understated wife of six years always stood beside him. Drake got him a job in the cybersecurity department several years back, and he was likely to remain there for the foreseeable future. Well, we were foolish enough to plan a fishing excursion despite all the warnings against it due to the inclement weather, Drake continued raising his voice slightly when he noticed Lucine's mind wandering as if visualising the entire event. He snapped his fingers in front of her eyes, jolting her back into the room. Our parents were out of town and we thought we knew everything. Drake went on to share his story about the storm and how an alien being named Morphanai flew up from the waters to rescue him. Lucine's eyes widened. I know it sounds preposterous, he laughed gauging her reaction. I believe you, Lucine responded, astonished that she unequivocally did. Well, I was supposed to die that day, but I didn't. And I was saved by an alien being. Who would have thought it? He didn't wait for an answer. Soon after that, I realized my purpose in life. There are beings on this earth, some who are 
here to help us, like Morph and I, and others who mean to harm us. It is my mission to help navigate the murky waters of intergalactic negotiations to create unity, while also protecting Earth from being exploited. Doing that requires that we sometimes break the rules. You understand what I'm saying? Lucine nodded, although she wasn't completely certain that she did. All she knew was that at that moment, she wanted to both prove to herself her value and not let her boss down. For some reason, she needed his approval. Still, something felt wrong about this. I'm just not sure... She began. You can't spend the rest of your life hiding behind the safety of books and file cabinets, Lucy. That hurt, she thought. Now I know you'll find a way. Those numbers are... Lucine watched the numbers scroll across her mind as she committed them to memory. She nodded and quietly left the room. <laughs>